Welcome to the Happier and Healthier Podcast. I'm your host, Maria Marlowe, and this is a place where we don't rely on good luck or good genes for our health and happiness, but rather we create it with our thoughts and our actions each and every single day. Each week, I'll bring you a thought or a guest that will help you live your happiest and healthiest life. Are you ready? Welcome back to the Happier and Healthier Podcast. You guys know that I'm a huge proponent of a healthy diet, and I truly believe that food changes everything. But today, we're going to focus on some of the non-food factors that are having a significant impact on your health, and you probably don't even realize it. I'm talking about emotions and toxins. To discuss this topic, I brought in naturopathic doctor, Dr. Christian Gonzalez, who specializes in functional medicine and oncology. He believes the body has an innate ability to heal itself when given favorable conditions to thrive. So he's going to share some of those favorable conditions with us today. Before we get to the interview, I want to take a moment to share with you about a brand that helps make the Happier and Healthier podcast possible. If you're looking to improve your health, and especially if you're looking to improve your digestive health, you have to check out Hyperbiotics Pro 15 Probiotic. This probiotic is the most effective probiotic that I've found on the market, and it's clinically shown to be 15 times more effective than the common probiotic capsules that you'll find at the health food store. If you suffer from regular bloating, gas, or irregularity, definitely consider taking a high-quality probiotic to help. You can learn more at hyperbiotics.com and use the code HYPERMARIA for 20% off your order. Dr. Gonzalez, welcome to the show. Hi, how are you? Thank you for having me on. It's a, it's a pleasure. Of course. So as a naturopathic doctor, I'm curious what led you down this path? How did you become a naturopathic doctor or why? Yeah, I mean, I tried to answer this question in so many different versions. And I think the truest version and the way that I can answer it is just that seeing what naturopathic medicine can do for a person as a whole permanently is the most eye-opening thing. Because you and I both know how the paradigm is conventionally. And we have people who are coming into their doctor and they are being prescribed something to mask the symptoms, right? And then going home, but that masking of the symptoms kind of suppresses over time your body's call saying, hey, please help me. And by doing it, it's perpetuating disease. It's just putting it under the rug, putting it under the rug. And when I was little, I thought I would get away with stuff when I cleaned my room and I would put stuff under the rug until it was seeping out of it and my mom would yell at me every time. But that's what happens. It seeps out and then we start seeing diseases manifest. So for me, what I saw was on my path to dental school, I wanted to be an orthodontist. I thought that'd be pretty cool. And then I learned about what naturopathic medicine was about a year and a half too late, but I was like in it, I was ready to be an orthodontist. And then out of nowhere, this tidal wave of intuition hits me and it's, it says, hey, this medicine that aligns with every part of your being, the fabric of who you are, what are you doing? So I, I had a crossroads and I said, I'm out. Like following intuition is the most important thing you do in your life. And I felt palpably what that intuition said and pulled me out of there. And then eight years later, I was, I'm here, but uh, it was the most rewarding and best intuitive decision I've ever made because now what, we, what I see is not only this, but my colleagues are so powerful in what we're doing for people's health. And then extending this even past naturopathic medicine, just what we're doing as a whole as a community is beautiful for people, you know? Yeah, and it makes a huge difference. I first went to a naturopathic doctor last year, and my first appointment, one of the biggest things that stood out to me was that she actually took an hour to talk to me about my history and what's going yeah. on in my life, yeah. which is unheard of at a traditional MD. I mean, yeah. you're in and out in 10 minutes flat if you're yeah. lucky, like maybe wow. five. So I thought that was interesting. And then, of course, I love just the overall holistic approach where you're looking at more than just the physical ailments and the symptoms, but really looking at the whole person and their life circumstances as well. So 
I'd love to talk about a few of these non-food factors that affect our health. And I saw on your Instagram, Dr. Gonzalez has a great Instagram. He's always posting really interesting things and valuable information. But I saw that you had posted that you recently had your Epstein-Barr virus relapse. And Mm -hmm. stealth viruses or stealth infections, rather, was something that I talked about on the Dr. Jess podcast, which if anyone... Yeah, has had a virus. Yeah, or, or, you know, stealth infections. Definitely check out her episode. But I think that people don't realize that if you had Epstein Barr virus or mono as a kid, you could, it could actually relapse. So I'd love you to talk a little bit more about that for someone who's maybe had Epstein Barr. What should they know? Yeah, so it's true. When you're a child, it's usually not as symptomatic as it would be when you're an adult. So I'm pretty sure I had it as a kid. But I really got hit with the tidal wave that is Epstein-Barr virus or mono in my first year of medical. And it's horrible. It's horrible. It's debilitating because it hits your muscles. It hits your joints. You have this chronic fatigue. I never felt anything like it, but I did remember coming home from class and I couldn't do anything but lay on my couch with like these legs full of lead that was so hard to pick up. And I never forget, I wanted to go to the bathroom. I was like, I have to pee so bad. But I couldn't even move my legs because I was so exhausted. I'm like, something is very, very wrong. So we, so that sort of was my first experience about what naturopathic medicine can do for things that usually a conventional doctor would just put, again, put a Band-Aid on. So I healed from that. It took a while, but I healed from it. I knew immediately, as you know, we can easily be pulled left and right and do so many things and then bite off all these chunks of things that we you know, don't have enough time for sort of my personality. So I'm like, yeah, I'll like so overextend myself in every way. And I started wearing me down. So obviously my immune system started getting more and more crappy. I stayed with the good foods, but my immune system was chipping away, chipping away. And then whoosh, I felt those symptoms again. And I remember I I came back and I laid on my bed and I was like, I have to pee. And I was like, I can't get up to pee right now. I was like, oh my God, is this, is this Epstein bar again? So I work uh, with a doctor and, and I went to him and I was like, let's test. So yeah, my titers came up. They were high. So immediately we just did everything that we can. I did everything we can naturopathically. And he has some, I know Dr. Jess is so about ozone therapy. So I did it. I did three weeks of it. And can you just explain for anyone who doesn't know what ozone therapy is, what that is? Yeah. So ozone therapy is this really cool intervention where basically in the most basic ways, we'll say it, sucking out your blood, injecting it with ozone, mixing it up and then reestablishing it in the body. But what that does is it, that ozone, it acts as a oxidant in the body, but not an oxidant to the point where you're thinking of a toxin in the body. It's a small oxidant that tells the body to produce more antioxidants as well as kill all those bugs that are affecting you. I've seen personally ozone help people even with Lyme and Epstein-Barr or indolent infections, but if you do it for three weeks every single day, it's not cheap, but it's helpful. It really is. So that was really cool to do that. So again, like Epstein-Barr virus is so complex because we can't just take, you know, a top quality herb and be like, oh, it's going to be fine. It sort of pushes you to reevaluate the way you're, how fast you're going and, you know, what your life is about. Yeah. As with all disease that comes up. Yeah. So it's funnily enough that this happened to you recently also, but it even happened to me and I had no idea. Like I had no idea that the mono or the Epstein-Barr virus could really relapse again. And back in November, I was feeling super exhausted. Like, and again, I was eating really healthy. I was eating all my greens and all the vegetables, all the colors and I just had this crazy tiredness and fatigue. So I'd went to the naturopathic doctor. She was like, you know, she knew from my health history, my extensive health history that I had had that in the past. She's like, oh, let's just test for it, see if it comes up. And sure enough, it came up as if it was reactivated. Yeah. So she's like, you need to chill. You need to stop overextending yourself and rest, take it easy and let, you know, let your body get back to normal, which it did. But yeah, I just thought it was really interesting. Like I would have never thought that in a million years that that could have been the cause. And people like us in our community, we have knowledge, right? About what we need to do and all the things, but it's not always true. Like even us as practitioners, we'll sacrifice sleep sometimes to get something done. We'll sacrifice the gym sometimes to get something done. I'm guilty of it. And again, you know, when I had it, when I was 20, about four, 25, I'm not 24, 25, you know, and, and it hit me way harder. So I think, like you said, we just need to reevaluate where we're at and why this came up, what's happening with our immune system, what's happening with our 
body are we detoxing? So, Right. I know you had listed a couple of practices and things that you were doing, like slowing down and um, a few other things. So if someone has any type of virus, what are some things that they could be doing to help get back to health? Yeah, so there's really good herbs out there at the most basic level, just starting really powerful herbs. We know that elderberry is as effective as many antivirals that we see out there conventionally. It's gentle, it tastes pretty good, and it's effective. I recommend it to patients who are not allergic to berries, but that's really important. There's a lot of really good formulas out there, but the point is this, like you have to make sure that you are getting a high quality herb or supplement because there's such a huge spectrum and no one is really regulating it. When it comes to antivirals, it's one of my favorite. I do like things though. I like targeting a lot of the immune system and stimulating. So medicinal mushrooms are really amazing at doing that because they're sort of an indirect way of targeting those viruses by stimulating your natural killer cells. And those guys are just looking for those viruses to kill. I love yeah. saunas. I love IR saunas. I am borderline about to get one for my apartment. Yeah, like yeah. <laughs> any minute now, we're just trying to make it happen. But with IR sauna, what that does is another way, stimulating the immune system. We know it does that while detoxifying because if your body's overburdened, let's say heavy metals, let's say environmental pollutants, well, what do you think your immune system is paying attention to as well, right? It's, it's refocusing on getting rid of that crap as well as the virus. So we have to think more like, where's our immune system at and how can we give it more love rather than just like, you know, pinpointing virals, antivirals at viruses and going comprehensive, right? We're holistic, right. we're holistic practitioners as a whole. Um, right. Yeah, that, yeah. I love those things. And the sun, the sun, the sun, the sun is not just for, it's not just for your immune system. It's for everything. You need to be out in the sun. You need to be out outside. I mean, that's my hippie side coming out, but it's true. We know, we know it does so much. Yeah. And that's an important point. We can't just rely on the supplement or the pill that we just are so used to relying on. We also have to do things like rest. We also have to do things like sweat, let's say in the sauna, and just do change some aspects of our lifestyle also if we really want to get back to health our quickest. It's a pill for an ill. That's what that's the way it happens. And you know, I'll get messages on Instagram saying, Hey, what can I take for this? I mean, you might as well practice conventionally if that's the case, right? It doesn't work that way. It's more like why did this come? How do we address those root causes rather than just addressing the body's way of talking to you? Right. You I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So speaking of antivirals, one topic that has been really popular on the podcast has been gut health. And I've been getting a lot of messages from people, also from clients, even in my family, people who had an infection, had to take an antibiotic, and then after the antibiotic feel like their body's a little bit off, particularly their gut is off. So for someone who has to take an antibiotic, well, one, are there any alternatives? And B, what can they do to repair or minimize damage to their gut health? Mm -hmm. So antibiotics should only be taken in the most dire and emergent situations. Because here's what you have. You have a colony, like a city of all these bugs, right? Or let's personify it to just a bunch of cool humans who are just living in harmony. And every single time you make the choice to take that antibiotic, there's an indefinite amount of people that just get wiped out. And they don't come back. It's over. You know, you're not going to see, you know, your best friend, Jane, your best friend, Bob. If they're part of that antibiotic susceptible population, it's gone. So we have to keep in mind that every single time you take antibiotics, you have a finite amount of probiotic bacteria gone. With that said, I'm not against antibiotics, right? If I have aggressive infection and you know, my leg is going to fall off, give me all the antibiotics in the world. Give me IV antibiotics, give it to me everywhere. But we have to keep in mind how to prevent anything such that we ever get to the point where we need antibiotics. With that said, it's so important to give your gut microbiome health. and it's hard to do that by just saying, here's the best high quality probiotic. We'll throw that at you. And you know what that is? You have a thriving city and you have a helicopter fly over and you just have like 10 people come at the helicopter and think that that's going to change the city, right? It's, we need to do more. We need to feed the city. We need to build resources and parks and, and water parks and community centers. And we do that by making sure we're getting prebiotic fibers, which is very important. As you know, you're the food guru. To giving these people this, this, these resistant starches that are important at perpetuating the growth and thriving of this community. 
And that keeps other microbes in check. So what I'm trying to say is doing it dietarily first, right? And then if you do experience a really bad infection, working with whatever it is. So say you have a bacterial infection, there's some really cool antibacterials. There's some really cool immune stimulators, as I mentioned. But then repairing it is, like you said, right? Like if there's a war going on, we want to rebuild the buildings, rebuild the city. So we can do that with really nice demulcent herbs first and foremost. Those demulcent herbs help coat all the inflammation and, and that's going on in the gut, and then reworking the microbiome. So we do that by rebuilding the soil, giving good foods that are helping perpetuate the growth, keeping the other guys intact, and then rebuilding the lining, those epithelial cells, giving them their food that they need via like glutamine, right? That's going to be an important nutrient that's going to help rebuild it. So you can get all these foods. Nature has blessed us with all of these nutrients and foods if we just pay attention to what we need, our body needs, right? And thankful that we have people like you to guide us when we have this, how do we build? What do we do? How do we get this from food? And then people on our side, where we're going here, let's put you on a protocol to rebuild the gut too. Everyone has gut issues. Everyone. It's it hard. Seems that way, yeah. Isn't it, isn't it, it I'm it sure really you have a million does. clients like that. Yeah. Yeah, and I always recount this story because it always sticks in my head that early on, I had a client and in the beginning, I also, I'll, I'll give them a questionnaire and ask them about their health and their history. And one of the questions I asked is, do you have any digestive issues? And this woman, she was like, no. And then I'm like, okay. And then like a little later on, I asked her about bloating and gas and she's like, yeah, I have it every day. I was like, oh, well, why didn't you tell me you had digestive issues? And she's like, oh, well, I just thought I was a gassy person. I thought that was normal. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, no, just because it happens every day doesn't mean that it's normal. Or, you know, just because you are constipated and you don't go every day doesn't mean that it's normal or you're a constipated person. It just means whatever you're eating or you're doing is throwing yeah. your body off. Yeah, you'd be shocked. There's so many people who are like, well, my mom was constipated. I mean, I go every three days. I'm like, that's not good. You know, it's so important, even hormonal perspective, to be pooping every single day. Everyone needs to be going every single day. Yeah. It's hard enough to dump all that stuff away. You can't just be holding it in your body because it gets reabsorbed and then there's big issues. So yeah. you're right. Like we have this consciousness now that, you know, even a slight gut dysfunction is normal, but it shouldn't be. Our gut should be thriving. We should feel good. We should have, um, the last iron gut I've ever heard someone have was my dad, right? I never heard someone have an iron gut since, but like that man can be anything, but he feels good all the time right? Never complains about his stomach. That's how we should be. We should all have iron guts. We should have that really thick mucosa that mirrors basically what our gut health looks like. But nowadays, I'm assuming if we go in with an, with an endoscope or any scopes and then we see that, it, we'll see really thin mucosa. And that's a problem why there's a lot of things that are affecting it outside of even bugs, right? Like we are ingesting so many pesticides and there's such poor regulation on that slash corruption. And what we know is this, even those pesticides can make, I mean, I love plants, right? And there was a book that came out that villainized all these plants because they have, they have high oxalates and high lectins and this and that. But we know that things like glyphosate can totally perpetuate the create a sensitivity to those things. So it's like, do we have food sensitivities? Are we allergic to potatoes or are we allergic to the pesticides used in potatoes? Is our body just rebelling against the crap that's being put in our food rather than the food itself? Because it's driving people crazy now. They're like, oh, now I can't eat tomatoes. What are you talking about? Right? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's fascinating. I actually just had on last week, the food babe. So Vani Hari was on talking about glyphosate and different agricultural chemicals and how they're messing with our health and how they're just so rampant. And even something like glyphosate, which was traditionally sprayed on GMO crops, it's now sprayed almost across the board, especially on grains and different crops. It's a drying agent. It uses a drying agent even to like oatmeal, right? Wheat. Exactly. And even with oatmeal, yeah, like that's why a lot of people, so oatmeal doesn't have gluten, but a lot of people have a sensitivity to it. And mm -hmm you know, sometimes they're like, oh, it's because it's processed in a facility that has gluten, there's cross-contamination. But others are like, uh, no, actually, it's a reaction to the glyphosate that's sprayed on it that's causing the reaction. Yeah. And even there's, there's a lot of cross-contamination because now there's like organic oat companies that are found to have glyphosate when they're rigorously testing for it, but it's still coming in there. And that's because there's cross-contamination from other farms. I talk about glyphosate. I did a whole rant on it in my podcast because 
it's something that I know I've been saying for 10 years now, 10, like I was one of the only naturopaths in my school who was saying like going to GMO rallies. And they were like, you're crazy. You're like a conspiracy theorist. But the fact of the matter is, is that now there's more and more data coming out to show. And then when that company, Monsanto's emails came out two years ago, when they were being sued, they, these emails came to surface and you saw just how corrupt and how desperately they're trying to suppress the real stuff that it does, basically showing that it causes many diseases. They're desperately trying to hide it. And we saw it in their emails, but it's still put it out there. Yeah. So how can we, so for anyone listening who wants to avoid glyphosate, what steps can they take? Okay. So th- one of the most simple steps is choosing organic food. And if you're not going to go fully organic, you can always follow the clean 15 and dirty dozen by an environmental working group. You can literally type that in and see what foods need to be, the 12 foods that need to be organic, the 15 that don't need to be organic. That's a good start. I personally just try to get everything organic as much as I can. That's still not going to ensure everything because there is, like I said, cross-contamination, right? There's even organic potato chips that, uh, that they found glyphosate on. But it's such a good step for you to do. I personally, almost everyone gets a glyphosate test with me. It's a $100 test. That's it. And we can see, I registered for it at a small level, that every single one of my cancer patients has it over 50%. I haven't seen a cancer patient not have glyphosate over 50% to this day. And I tell this story a lot. I have this actually active patient. We spoke, we started a month ago and she has lymphoma and it's associated with lymphoma, uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So she's my age. I was like, it's so crazy to see people so young. And I was talking to her. And usually when I ask people about environmental toxins, they don't know. They're like, I don't know, maybe like, I don't, I'm, some people are like, I live by a farm and maybe. But this girl, she was two years, two summers ago, preserving these wildflowers in some part of California, but she was given glyphosate to spray around the weeds with no protection, just backpacks and the spray guns, no protections. And I, like, I say, did it cause your cancer? I can't say that, but I can't say that that's a huge chunk of the pie because we already know what it does. That janitor, Mr. Johnson, he sued Monsanto for that and he won $280 million. I don't know if he's going to see all of that, but still 280 million. That's crazy. That yeah. says a lot about where we're shifting about villainizing a company that, in my opinion, is poisoning us perpetually. Yeah, no, it's so scary. I just read the book Whitewash. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's all about how these agricultural chemical companies have made it appear as if their chemicals are totally benign and you don't have to worry about them. You could spray them without suiting up and, you know, but that many of these farmers are coming down with cancer, particularly lymphoma. So Mm -hmm. yeah, it was just really a fascinating look at what's going on and what they're doing and how it's not only affecting the farms that they're spraying it on, but like you said, it blows over, right? It, you know, the farms don't have walls. So mm-hmm. it's blowing into the water. It's blowing into the neighbor's maybe organic farm and other places. So yeah, it's almost like we can't escape it. Of course, there's a lot of things that we can do to limit our exposure. And when you're eating organically, you're limiting it as much as humanly possible. But that it is, it's just persisting in our environment. And that's why it is so important for people to choose organic and to make choices that are going to, you know, force companies to go where consumers are putting their money. So that's how you vote, right? Yeah. I'm telling you, any given day now, all of a sudden, you're going to have all these big companies that were poisoning us 10 years ago go, oh, organic, let's start making all. And we see that already. Pepsi's making organic stuff. Kraft is making organic stuff. Everyone is getting in the game now. Why? Because we're voting with our dollar. Right. So, Another thing I was mining, you know, mining your Instagram for different topic ideas. And I came across a quote on there that I thought was really interesting that I'd love you to explain a little bit. So the quote was, the organs weep the tears the eyes refuse to shed by Sir William Osler. So what is the relationship between emotional trauma and illness? I'm so happy you asked me this because you know that like anytime we get to mind, body, emotional trauma, that that's so resonant with me. I love talking about glyphosate, but this stuff is like the real health because we can make changes in people's health permanently once we get to the root, right? And so much of disease has to do with where we stand with our connection with ourselves and and emotion and emotional trauma. There's so many levels and it's it's the worst in men because men, you know, we have this exterior that goes, you know, we're not supposed to weep anything or we're not even supposed to deal with these emotions. And, and it's suppressed and it's suppressed. And I say this because 
I've given the best supplemental protocols. I put people in the best diet, the best lifestyle stuff, and they're doing better, but something's still sticking around. Well, they forgave their dad. They broke up with their boyfriend. They, all these things that, that, that was holding them energetically, all that stuff that was holding that pain, that trauma, that low vibrational energy within them is released. And I kid you not, you, you see changes and even they look physically different, right? They're, all of a sudden they have a glow, right? Because they've put themselves in an alignment, right? A healthy alignment. Health and, and permanent health is about real alignment with yourself, with others, with nature. So putting yourself in healthy alignment, you can see, you and I will see, we can see people, we go, that person looks happy and healthy and glowing, right? And that's because that person's in alignment. They've, they've chased their, to chase down their demons. So that quote is amazing. It's by William Osler and he's the, one of the fathers of conventional medicine, right? How ironic that that's not even followed or it's not even emphasized, but one of the fathers right. of conventional medicine is saying this and it's true because if you're not able to even identify your emotions nonetheless let them out, then where, where do they go? Do we, we put them under the rug, right? And then our body's affected. So the organs then are affected, right? You have something like, stuff, however your constitution is and your susceptibilities, digestive stuff, right? You have heart issues, right? Muscle, joint, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's a, but I've seen people get better just by addressing the deep, deep stuff that we don't even want to think about, right? Yeah, I can definitely believe that. And it's so true. When you see someone that's just so happy and just radiating happiness, they're usually quite healthy. And even if they don't eat a great diet, even if they're smoking cigarettes and drinking and doing all this stuff, if they just have this happy predisposition and happy mindset, they're usually in pretty good health and have nothing to complain about. But whereas even the ones who are eating the kale and the broccoli and working out, but are not happy in some way. There, there's usually some physical ailments going on. Yeah, and as you get more and more in touch and pay attention, you can feel this. You can feel this from people. You can feel people who are in an alignment of true happiness and true health versus the ones who are trying to be in alignment versus the ones who are way off of it, right? Yeah. And you can see, like you said, I've seen people eat the best diets and on the best protocols and running miles every day and working out all the time but they are still holding on to something so deep and so painful, right? And when you say that one trigger, it touches them so deeply that it's over, you know? And they can have a cathartic episode for three days. They won't leave their house, but guess what? They come out a new man or woman. This is why it's so important for us to pay so much attention to what is holding us back from greatness, right? And by greatness, I mean our healthiest self, mentally, physically, emotionally, business-wise, creatively, What's holding us back? Take some time and meditate and start going deep into that and figure out what is it? Because we, we'll never be able to find out if we're on our phone or talking to people all day. We need that silence. We need that alone time to really reflect back to our childhood, back to our teenagers, back to our young adulthood and figure out why we are where we're at. Right. Right. Yeah, because I think a lot of people don't even realize that they're holding on to something. They don't even realize that they have a sadness or it's just an unhappiness, something. And it takes a little prodding, whether that's from someone else or just through self-reflection to actually figure out what is going on. Yeah. And like I said, men, we have no idea. Well, I don't know. I don't know what's going on with me. Right. But the truth of the matter is, is that everyone has some traumas, you know, to what level it affects you. I don't know. But why not pay attention to it? And at least if we make it a priority, the intention, just having the intention starts unfolding that reality for ourselves. Yeah. And if someone wants to dig deeper into that, what do you think is the best way to start? Like maybe going to a certain practitioner? Or... Yeah. Well, there's different ways. I personally am biased towards the power of meditation because that's changed my life. But it's not just that. I wake up and I've, I've told patients to do this, wake up, immediately grab your journal and write. Because what you're doing is you're in an unbiased state. That conscious mind isn't taking over where it's giving you repetitive dialogue about yourself and others, and you're able to write really freely. Or you could just meditate and write. Regardless, taking that time yourself starts bringing out deep emotions. Another exercise that I just intuitively started doing is going back to parts of my life when I was a kid. So start when I was a kid, I was thinking about places I hung out. And then I started remembering some traumatic events that I didn't even remember. Right. I was like, Oh my God, I did get beat up by a bunch of kids. And I was like eight years old. Why? And then how did that affect me? Well, I learned that 
it affected my way of expressing myself through words and fashion and whatever it may be because I got beat up for wearing a jean jacket that was very loud and flamboyant. But regardless, like this is what I'm trying to say. I would have never known if I didn't go back to that time period in my life in those places in those people and go, oh, holy shit, that stuck with me. There's something there. And then going back to high school, oh, wait, that was kind of traumatic. I never even knew that stuck with me. By doing that work ourselves, oh my God, what happens is we start letting go and we start shifting our vibration to a new vibration. When we let go of that stuff, all of a sudden, our own true energy, that alignment I talk about, starts becoming more aligned. And we're like, oh, I'm starting to feel better. And I'm starting to experience different things because now you're in a new vibration. So it's one of the most beautiful practices. I don't know. And then look, therapy can be wonderful for people. Some people just need to sit down and talk it out. But truly, that alone time is the most powerful thing you can ever do for your life. Yeah, I love that. I, and I always say that on this podcast that we need to do more self-reflection because I think we are always just so busy or any second that we have that we're not doing something, we're on our phone, we're checking Instagram and we just never have time to actually reflect on our day, on ourselves, anything. And just giving yourself that quiet time to do that, you'd be amazed what actually pops into your head. Yeah. And make it a habit to t- take a chunk out of your day. So in the morning, if you're a busy, busy person, then take 30 minutes in the morning, 30 minutes at night or an hour in the morning. And that's it. But carve out something. And even if you don't have time, do it in the car, turn it off and speak out things like 10 things you're grateful for anything. How many of us don't even pay attention that we're grateful that we even woke up, right? Or we're even walking to the bathroom to brush our teeth because we're on autopilot, right? But like I said, that vibration of gratitude pushes you in such an alignment. It can change your life, change your perspective, change your health, right? For sure. Yeah. So make your own, design your own self-reflection time. It can have affirmations. It can have gratitude. It can have meditation. It can have yoga. It just whatever it is to start exploring who you are, right? Because we can't do that when we're on Instagram all day or (laughs) just chatting and taking calls. Like I'm guilty of it, you know, but, but I still try to make time for myself. Yeah. No. And when I started having a daily gratitude practice, I have to say that just shifted my day and my mood so, so much because even if you just take a couple minutes to do it and just think about what you're grateful for, because there's so much to be grateful for, it really just starts you off on such a better foot for your day. So yeah, something I highly, highly recommend as well. I've never heard one person say gratitude practices were the worst idea and wasted time in my life. Yeah. (laughs) Everyone who does it is like, that changed something in me. It's so easy. 10 things. Feel it. Well, it just shifts your perspective, right? And everything is perspective. So, you know, if you want to see bad, you'll see bad. If you want to see good, you'll see good. And by immediately shifting your perspective first thing in the morning to only search for the good, you're kind of training yourself then throughout the day to search for the good. Yeah. And even physically, you'll retrain your neurons to start wiring that way. That's like what Joe Dispenza talks about. He's saying that, you know, the more you perpetuate this dialogue within yourself, the more your body just goes, all right, let's just form ourselves based on that. So you, your wiring and firing of your neurons just reflects the way you think. You can totally change your brain morphology by doing that. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's really amazing and fascinating, all the research around that. Mm-hmm. So let's talk love and relationships. I know that's an interest of yours. And how does that play a role in our health? It plays such a role. I mean, if you're submitting to be with someone, live with someone, marry someone, that can either be one of the best decisions or worst decisions of your life, right? It has to be such a powerful one because that can be the number one source of stress in your life. So the importance of identifying a person who is a true asset to who you are. Asset, right? Not, and this is one of the biggest trip ups in any relationship is when we start forming our identity based on someone else. By doing that, all of a sudden you guys are on a break. You guys break up. Who am I? I don't know who I am. Your sense of self is in turmoil. You're falling apart. You're going crazy and you're desperately doing these things to try to regain who you are. But it's so important to identify a partner who's inspiring enough to align with who you are. So I always tell people, if you're desperate to go out with someone or have someone in your life, first identify who you are in relation to yourself and others, right? I do those, do those practices and feel who you are. Let go of those traumas because 
universe is going to give you people who can trigger you so well to show you a mirror of who you are and those traumas that you need to let go. Shit, I've been through it so many times, right? Like, I'm like, oh, I'm going to villainize you because you're showing me who I am or who I, who I think I am, right? I'm going to villainize you because you're showing me all my traumas and scars. And we do that. We villainize the people and then we go, it didn't work out. She was just crazy. He was crazy. When in fact, that person was such a blessing to our lives because they've given us this opportunity to heal the deepest part of us. And that is so important. And we need to take that. We need to take the people who come into our lives with gratitude and knowing that they're in our lives to show us such deep healing within us, right? It's, that's what I'm trying to say. When you get into a loving relationship, you've got to have love for yourself first. And I'm talking about true love, right? You can't look for voids. You can't have voids and look for those voids to be filled by someone else. Well, he makes me happy. Shit, you should be happy already. He should add to your happiness, right? She completes me. I can't hear that one. She, complete, she completes you. What, were you. what were you missing apart before that? No, man, you were whole, you know? She adds to your completeness. And the reason I, I stress this so much is because how much stress can come from a partner or you not getting along with a partner when you haven't addressed these things for yourself. I mean, that'll mess up your gut health. That'll mess up your hormones. That'll cause you back pain, knee pain. It'll, I had a patient. She had, she's like, Dr. G, I can't poop. I said, okay. Let's talk about it. We identified all these crappy foods she was eating. I took her off dairy. You have to take people off dairy if they're not pooping for sure. Took her off gluten, took her off these processed foods. And then, you know, we put her on this like awesome gut protocol. We were ready to do all these like stool tests. And then I went back to the part where I said, why aren't I addressing her mind body like I should be? Well, before I even brought that up, she's like, oh yeah, Dr. G, I'm pooping now. I broke up with my boyfriend. Like she broke up with this guy who was holding her energy down, right? Because her sense of self was coming from this guy. He was, he was completing her. And her body didn't knew what she was doing. Her mind knew what she was doing, but the way she was acting was not in accordance with that. So she was finally pooping. And, you know, we only need, I only need to see her once. But the, the point is, is that that partner could be the biggest stress of your life or the biggest contributor to your happiness and inspiration. So why not be with someone who totally raises your vibration that is just like everyday inspiring? That doesn't mean you're not, guys are going to have an argument. We're human beings. We have egos. But learning how to show up for each other in those arguments and be loving rather than you know, being victimized or egoic. Yeah, it definitely takes a lot of, I think, discipline in a way to really be your own person and have your own identity and not just kind of fall into a relationship. Because I think in our, our society, our culture, if you're not in a relationship or you're not married by a certain age, there's just a lot of pressure and people feel like that means something, right? So there's this pressure just to be in a relationship, especially like I see it, you know, as women get into their late twenties and thirties, if they're not married, they're like, okay, I just, I need to get married, you know? And then they find themselves in these relationships that are not really suiting them and that are causing stress or that are not exactly what they're looking for, but they kind of feel like trapped. And it's really important that we never feel that way and really understand that our relationships are not what define us and that we do have to be really strong and love ourselves and be happy on our own before we can find that partner that is going to just kind of add to our life and not stress us out and not uh, take away from it. Yeah, because no one should be dictating your life timeline or, or what you're here to do, right? It, regardless if it's, I, I know, listen, I'm Latin. You grew up in a family that go, you know, where's your girlfriend? You have a girlfriend? When are you going to get married though? Or, you know, how old are you now? I'm like, all right, all right relax. Because I'm on my own timeline and everyone should be on their own timeline, regardless of societal pressures, family pressures, because your soul doesn't care about societal pressures or family. It cares about what you're here to do. And if you're here to change your world, another person's world or the world, then let's get aligned with that and let everything else come to us. The people, the places, the things, the situations, all that beautiful stuff comes to us when we're vibrating at that alignment, that nature alignment that I was talking about. Attract, someone said, you know, Instagram, you could do ask me anything. And it said, where can I find a man like you? I was like, okay, you're not going to find a man like me. You're going to attract it. Like have that vibration. So you like be a mirror of what you want to attract in another. Right. So I said, that's what I said. Like, don't look for a man like me, like be that and then attract a person of that same vibration. Yeah. I love that. 
And speaking of purpose, because you had mentioned that, what what role does purpose and having a purpose and a drive have in our health? It is one of my top pillars of health, actually, a sense of purpose. We're here to do so much more than sit in a cubicle and complete a job and go home and cook dinner and watch TV. We have so much potential and creative energy, and we're so powerful as human beings. We can change, like I said, a person's world, our world, or the, or the world. And by understanding how powerful we are and aligning with a sense of purpose, that's what we're here to do. We're here to do so much more than something that is just not aligned with us. So if you're going to job and you don't even look forward to it, it doesn't bring you joy. It doesn't fill your cup, right? You're not vibrating. You're not going, oh my God, today at work, this is what I'm going to do. Or today when you come back and you go, Jesus, that day at work was amazing, but let's see how it's going to go tomorrow. Like that's your life. And having a sense of purpose is going to be able to shift your life because when you have a sense of purpose, you have something to wake up to. You have something, that, how you're going to contribute to the world. And again, your health responds to that. If you have mental wealth, your health is going to go, thank you. Right? So we have to have a sense of purpose. I don't even care. Look, if your sense of purpose, if you're going to a job that is, uh, let's not even talk about jobs, do something that is aligned with who you are. If your sense of purpose is knitting the best sweaters in your town, then knit, those, knit the hell out of those sweaters so they look beautiful and put them out there and give them to people and sell them to people. Do whatever you want, but fulfill that sense of purpose because we are creative beings and we have that creative energy within us. For sure. I'm a huge believer that purpose really is pivotal to our health as well, because if you're miserable and you just feel lost and like you're blowing with the wind, you're just not, you don't have that energy to, um, or just that drive to even want to live or to even want to take care of yourself. You know, it's just kind of like, uh, and you just kind of go through life blowing with the wind, but having that core purpose really, I feel like motivates you in every area of your life to really stay on track and to take care of yourself. There was a study that showed that people who have a sense of purpose have less visits to the doctor and better health outcomes versus those who don't have a sense of purpose. They actually measured oh, wow. this because like you said, you think your body doesn't listen to you. If you're like, I hate my job. I hate my life. Your body responds to every thought that you have, right? So if yes. you're vibrating, you're like, I can't wait to do this tomorrow. I can't wait to do this a year from now, two years from now. That's not going to say you're not going to become sick and, and die. But that's telling your body, hey, I have purpose. I have, a, I have future things that I want to do so bad for people and others in the world. So your body responds. Your body understands. Like, watch your thoughts and be, make sure you're saying things that are loving your body, loving your sense of purpose, loving your journey, what you're here to do. Yeah, that's such a fascinating study. I, I've never heard that before, but definitely really, really interesting. So we've talked about a few different things. We talked about stealth infections. We've talked about toxins, relationships, purpose. Are there any other areas of our life that we should be looking at? Or you had mentioned your pillars of health. So, so what are some of your pillars of health? I think we've talked about a lot of good stuff now. Now that I think about it, this is good. I love well-rounded interviews. This is really awesome. But I can't emphasize the importance of having a good cycle when it comes to sleep and just circadian cycles because evolutionarily, that's where we evolved about following that. And so many parts and facets of our body from immune system to hormones really are governed by this respect to what our bodies want to do. So we've kind of messed it up with blue lights and phones and TVs, Netflix late at night, that one more show that we want to watch before bed. I think that we really need to get back to basics. And when I say that is when it's time to fall asleep, and it's usually for most people right around 10 or before 10, we want to be in bed between 10 and 2 to get our deepest rest, making sure we're doing that because what we're doing is our cortisol is low, our melatonin is high. That's an anti-cancer. That's an antioxidant. Our immune system is regenerating, replenishing. We're detoxifying. So having that respect and then having a full night's sleep. And then really important is that we have something called a cortisol awakening response. We, we should wake up. Everyone should wake up even if you're in a dark part of town and open your blinds, because one day that sun's going to hit you. We need that sun to awaken us. So as soon as we open our eyes, let's not reach for our phone and have artificial blue light, but leave our phone in silent mode. We go to our curtain, open it up and let that sun hit us for a minute or two, because what that's doing is it's raising our cortisol the way it's supposed to be. That can help reset those hormones throughout the day. 
really important to get back to nature. And I can't emphasize enough taking off your shoes and putting it on grass, putting it on, on the ground. The electromagnetic forces from there are so helpful. Getting out in nature, negative ions, giving that to our body. Like This stuff is more powerful than coffee. This stuff is more powerful than your everyday multivitamin, right? Because nature is way more intelligent than the scientists who made the multivitamin that you're eating. You see what I'm trying to say? So that's one major, major pillar. I talk about detox a lot because it's so important. We need to be detoxing. We need to be knowing what's going in our food, in our mouth every day, what we're drinking. Water has to be clean. Make sure you have a really good purified filter. I like the Berkey one. I don't associate with them, but I just recommend it for people because it does purify the water. And making sure we're detoxing. Get in an IR sauna. Exercise every single day or as much as you can. Work out. The power of exercise is... I can't even understate how powerful exercise is. Even in preventative for breast cancer, people with breast cancer, after breast cancer, not even just cancer, in general, making sure that we are utilizing the power of what we're meant to do. We're not meant to sit down. Evolutionarily, we're meant to walk miles and miles, climb trees, climb mountains, throw stones off the top of a mountain and, you know, bat our chest. That's what we're supposed to do. But let's get, I think we just need to think about, is this something that is aligned with how nature intended it to be? Right? Is it? Yeah. But and, yeah, those are all great tips. Yeah. That's just yeah. And just being in nature, it just feels so good. Just simply like being there. Like I'm living in Dubai now, which is a beautiful place, but it's very, it's, it's a city, right? So there's, there's not a lot of green, you know, pastures or mountains or anything like that, right in the city. So I went to Singapore recently and I was obsessed because it's like a huge garden. There's just forests and like flower gardens and everywhere you go is green and so lush. And I just wanted to sit there and just like soak it all in because I was like, I just need some, some nature time. Yeah. And that's the danger with living in cities. I mean, I'm in LA and I, I couldn't live in Hollywood or West Hollywood or downtown or so. I just couldn't do it because I need to be by the beach. And how many people go to the beach or go in nature really angry and then come out of nature and go, oh, I'm still angry. I don't know what I'm going to do still. No, you go in nature and there's something that it teaches you. It's something that it heals. When you're by the ocean, you're healing. When you're walking in the forest, you're healing. When you do a hike, how many of us do a hike and we're like, I hate the world still. It, it, there's something so powerful that it does beyond negative ions that science will never catch up to because we just can't understand on a quantum physics level what it does, but it does such powerful things to us. So like, let's get in touch with it. Ask yourself in bed, did I have any nature in my life today? No? All right, let me do it tomorrow. No, let me do it Wednesday. Let me do it Thursday, whatever it is. Yeah. And even if you are living in a city, find a park. Like in New York, I used to go to Central Park almost every single day because I just needed it. I just needed to be by some green or um, even go by the river. You know, if there's a river or a lake or something, just try and find as much green or nature as possible and work with what you have. And then maybe on the weekends, you can go actually upstate or somewhere where it's a bit more yeah. nature. Yeah. I mean, I, I did my residency in Philly and we had a garden in our hospital. And I don't, without fail, with there was no way around it. I was going outside for at least 30 minutes in the sun, in the garden, minus the winter, but I was going outside and I, I wouldn't let anything change that during my lunch break because that, I, that was so important to me to be around the, the little slice of nature in the city. If you live in the city, then find it, you know, yeah. there's parks there, take off yeah. your shoes, get in, get in the green, you know? Mm hmm so one last question that I like to ask all my guests is that if you can leave our listeners with just one tip or piece of advice for them to live a happier and healthier life, what would that be? Your time, me time. It's, it's my number one tip for any health. You know, I don't care what you're dealing with. I don't care what you have. Me time is the most important thing. You can have a whole family, make your me time in the shower and spend an extra 10 minutes in the shower, make your me time in the car. I don't care how busy you are slice out a time of the day to have your own time. Because if you're running on autopilot every day, if you're in a tornado every single day of kids, children, clients, calls, patients, you will never, ever find your center or your groundedness or, or true, true happiness, true happiness. You cannot be happy. You can't be. I don't care if money's coming in. I don't care if clients coming in. You cannot truly be happy unless you're in your own alignment. And the way to be in your alignment is to take your time and reflect on your days, on your day, on your year, 
the past year, the year before, whatever it is, reflecting on who you are and changing your vibration. You can be depressed, you can be angry, you can be sad, whatever it is, and you can always go back to that same vibration that you have in your alone time because when you have that alone time, you will be able to reset yourself all the time. Meditate, gratitude, affirmations, journal, go outside ground, go in nature, something for yourself because like I said, it can change your relation to, even if you have an incurable disease, it will still change your perspective in your relationship with an incurable disease. Preventatively, it can help you prevent incurable diseases. It can help you overall with your health. So this is why I say, because your me time and then everything else, in my opinion, sprouts from that. Yeah, that's a great piece of advice. Well, thank you so much for sharing all your insights today. And if anyone wants to learn more, where should they look for you? Okay, two places. I have my Instagram. It's at D-O-C-T-O-R, Dr. Dot G, and then underscore and I have my own podcast, which breaking news, you're going to be on it next month. So I can't so wait. That's, that's Heal Thyself, Heal Space T H Y Thyself, Space Self. And that's on YouTube and iTunes and Spotify. It just started three weeks ago, but I love the fact that we have platforms to do these things, right? To, for people to download and they can hear us. Like, this is amazing. What talk about gratitude? Like, how blessed are we that we can, you can be in Dubai right now. I can be in LA. It's night, it's morning for you. And we're able to just do this and we're going to publish it and people are going to hear it. And one person, it might change your life. Yeah, it's amazing. Podcasting is such a great platform and just the internet, even Instagram. I'm so grateful for Instagram because I learned so much from people like you who are posting this amazing information all the time. And it's just, we have so many ways to learn. And yeah, I'm just grateful for people like you and for all of these platforms that allow us to learn. Well, on behalf of myself and all your listeners, we're grateful for you. Well, thank you. Well, thanks for tuning in, guys. And we'll be back next week. Thank you.